Hi, I'm Benjamin Mac Jackson, founder of the World War II Veterans History Project. I started this project in the summer of 2015 with the goal of providing knowledge and inspiration to my generation so they can better appreciate and understand what these heroes went through. My mission is to preserve the memories of the greatest generation. In this story, we introduce you to Private First Class David Lofgren. We'll hear about his experiences while fighting in the cities and forests of Europe, and even participating in the Battle of the Bulge. From liberating a German forced labor camp to his glorious homecoming experience, David Lofgren's amazing story will take you back to 1944, when our nation was deep in a global war. Here is his story. My name is David Lofgren. And my rank in the service was PFC, Private First Class. I decided to join up. So rather than be in the reserves, I was now in the regular army. And so from there, I started going to camp up to New York, which was Long Island. And, uh, and from there, we shipped out and went down to South Carolina. So went from there, Camp McCoy, to Boston, go overseas, and went over on troop ships. And uh, they were in convoys. And uh, with the convoys, we were escorted also by destroyers on the outside, and the convoys had all kinds of ships, troop ships, um, all kinds of cargo ships and so forth, taking tanks and all this other equipment to carry overseas. And uh, so we got over there, but we spent on the water, probably spent about uh, 15, 17 days on the water. We were stationed at Bournemouth, England, for about uh, two months, and uh, then we go from there, ships again, over the small ships, LCIs and so forth, and we went over to France. And uh, France had over and said, the invasion had taken place already. And so thank goodness I wasn't in that part of it. And, uh, but uh, they started taking many of these places, and as a result, we went into La Havre in France. And from La Havre, we moved from there by truck and started moving up to the front. And that's when we got into the Battle of the Bulge. So I was in that uh, for maybe a month, I guess, something like that. But we were at the tail end of the Battle of the Bulge. And so it was, uh, it was tough over there. It was cold, freezing, snow, and uh, all kinds of weapons in the forest and so forth. So when they're firing at you and so forth, the mortars and what have you are hitting the trees. So when something hits the trees, you don't know where they're going to land. So you don't know where the shrapnel is going either. The enemy tanks were ahead of you somewhere, and so you didn't know quite where, and uh, you might come up upon them. But when you're going through the forest, all these artillery shells, mortar shells, are being fired at you as you're going through. But you've got to keep moving. There's the one thing the general said at the time, we can't gain any ground if we don't move over it. And, uh, and this is about what it amounts to. So he was very insistent on seeing to it that we kept going. And some, if they started to take, take a break or something like this, he didn't like it. And in fact, our battalion headquarters, who was a major green, was there. And he stopped, stopped us at one point after a couple of days of fighting. And, uh, and we told us he's going to take a break, take a breather. And, uh, so when we stopped and he was questioned about what had taken place, the next day he was gone. They wanted, uh, really want an officer in there that's going to move it and move everybody. And that's what he was interested in. So we got a new commander and uh, when, he was, when he got there, we moved. 
and uh, we didn't hesitate. But all people get hurt, but at the same time, you're not going to you're not going to acquire what you need to acquire unless you move. And uh, but he was a, a general general we had was uh, was really great. We moved from towards Luxembourg, and we stayed there for about two weeks until all the artillery was built up that the army had established for all kinds of guns. Big guns, big, big guns, and so forth. And uh, I never realized how many guns were back there, but I had to go back to division headquarters one time. And while I was back on the way back there, we had to pass through all these areas where they had 105s, 155s, or 205s, and so forth. And at that time, those of us, I was in an R&R section of a, a battalion. INR is intelligence and reconnaissance. So we were involved with uh, scouting, also in, uh, going into enemy, to enemy territory and so forth, to contact some, pick up prisoners, steal some prisoners and bring them back with you, and uh, which is not always easy. But uh, from there then we crossed the river to go over into Germany, and that's when we hit the, all the pillboxes and so forth. And Patton, came up right where we were at that time. I did not see him, but I know he was there. We started moving east. And uh, when you're moving east, you're getting on trucks or you're marching and so forth, and you go from one town to another, take that one, sometimes it takes you two or three days before you get it. And, uh, and, and it's a lot of firefights and what have you going in there. And going into towns and fighting in towns are very difficult. And uh, because you don't know what's inside the house. And uh, so you have to be very careful when you're going in. And so we did that until all the way going through Germany, we were not too far from Czechoslovakia. And we uh, opened up some labor camps that were over there. This labor camp that we came, we came to was mostly women. And this labor camp was uh, a farm labor camp it was big, and of course most everything was done by by hand, you know, race hose and so forth. And uh, so when we came there, the many of the w women that were there were not German women; they were using the captives of Poland and so forth. This this particular one had Polish women. One time we came into a, a, a prisoner of war camp and uh, so forth, and German POWs who were uh, German, not POWs, but uh, German soldiers were in there overseeing the uh, camps that they were, not just the labor, cam labor camps, but also the uh, prisoners' camps of Russia and so forth. So when you went in there, that's the thing that just amazed me the most. I just, you could never, when you saw pictures, and I, I know you've probably seen them somewhere, but when you see the pictures, it's, a, it's amazing how emaciated some of these people were, and some of them were almost dead and so forth. And so as we came through, some of the guys were going to be nice and help them out, give them some cheese from our K rations and so forth. And it's the one thing they couldn't, they couldn't eat, period. They had to go to kind of start at that point, they'd start with some soups or what have you. But uh, so some of them gave them some cheese and so forth, and uh, I'm sure it didn't, didn't do them any good. But they got that stopped in a hurry, of course, and as a result, we didn't do much of that. But you don't stay in these places very long, because you're constantly moving. you got to go out. You can't stay in there. So they just pull up, take a camp like this, and leave uh, a company of, of men uh, to take over the camp and uh, see to it everything's taken care of, and the prisoners that are in there uh, treated properly and what have you. I think it's the most shocking thing to see something like that, but they're much similar to what you may have seen on TV at some of these concentration camps and so forth. It's amazing what, uh, how, they, how one could do that to anyone else always amazes me. We kept going east until we got to eastern Germany where we met the Russians. So we were one of the probably few outfits that actually met the Russians 
somewhere along the eastern front. Came home on the uh, Queen Mary, and uh, yeah, and uh, it's out. It was out in California. I think it's still out there. And uh, anyhow, let me check. It didn't take us. I think it was four days to get home, and everybody was sleeping on the decks and everywhere on the ship just to get get back. And you didn't have to worry about any ships being hit by torpedoes or what have you at that point. So they were just you know, with the lights on and so forth and going home. And then when you got into New York Harbor, if you've ever been to New York, as you come into the harbor, all the big buildings and so forth, and you come down the Belt Parkway, in Germany, what is now the Bell Parkway, and uh, as you came in, the, the Narrows is what they call it. And as you come in the Narrows, you were uh, on both sides, people were standing on along the shores and waving and what have you. They had the uh, fireboats in New York City. When any ship came in, the fireboats came out and gathered any number of them and followed the ship all the way to the dock. And they had the fireboats with fire and so forth. The water was going all over the place, you know. But the worst part was I was standing pretty close to the smokestack on the uh, Mary when I was coming in. Now, the one thing about it, you don't know how those horns were supposed to be for fogs, fog horns, you know, what they call them. And fog horns would uh, uh, be heard by some of the ship uh, 15 miles away, something like this. So I was standing next to it when the, fire, when the fog horn went off. <laughs> I thought my ears were going to float away. And, uh, but uh, it was a tremendous noise. And it was very exciting when we got in, into uh, New York. That's my story. Mr. Lofgren went on to become the principal at Claremont High School. Today, you'll find him working out at a local gym with his wife, Eleanor. Mr. Lofgren is 91 years old. In this story, we travel back to the front lines of North Africa and France with Private First Class Alfred Scheibner. Scheibner, who served as a forward observer during the war, was wounded in action in France and even received the Purple Heart. Hear firsthand how he survived a harrowing attack by a German plane on his jeep. Here's his story. My name is Alfred Scheibner, and my middle name is Arthur. My rank was PFC. And the reason why I'm a PFC is because Congress had a law, all returning privates will become PFCs. And that's the reason why I'm a PFC. <laughs> First days of service is when I left Philadelphia, I was told I'm going south, Fayetteville, North Carolina. And in December in Philadelphia, it was cold, so I thought we was going down south and have it warm. And by the time I got in Fayetteville, North Carolina, we had about three inches of snow. <laughs> and, and it was just as cold or not colder than Philadelphia. So that was my first day of, in the service. You might, uh, well, several days because it took, took a train ride, you might say, from Philly to, to North uh, Fayetteville. Indian Town Gap, that was the port of embarkation. And I, uh, when I got my bunk, the stranger sat the bunk next to me, another soldier, you might say, you know, but he was asking me all kinds of questions. And one question, he says, uh, suppose you get killed by a German, what would you do? What can you do? I says, I'm not, it'd be the end, wouldn't it? And, uh, so I just told him, I said, well, they'll just bury me and that's it. But I guess that, uh, afterwards I found out it was intelligence checking me out because I'm German descendant and they're going to send me in, in Europe instead of in the Pacific. 
I was among the first group of replacements of the North African campaign. What you we were to the infantry, and uh, sometimes we were even ahead of the infantry because we could get a secured ground, high ground to look over and have the infantry come up after us. I, I was first put in the number one, the first division. That was in Africa and Sicily. And then from Sicily, I was transferred into the third division that went to Italy and France. And, uh, and the first division packed up and went to England and they were in in on uh, Omaha Beach in France at the time, the big the big uh, invasion, which I missed out on. Being on the Forward Observer, we were in a situation where the, at that time the Air Force, the Army Corps, we call it the Air Corps, because they later on made the Air Force, but the Army Air Corps there was a unit called the 99th Fighter Squadron. When they left their point, uh, they, were, they were given the directions as to where to go and drop their bombs and strafe the personnel. And uh, what happened was we on the ground advanced to the point when the airplanes came over, they were bombing us and strafing us. Thinking, the guy I imagine from the air, and it's kind of hard to tell whether he's a German soldier or an American soldier. But we were, we fired all kinds of flares, let them do, but they just dropped their load and gone. And uh, they really did a, a number on us. When they brought them up to show their damage, they broke down. Every one of them broke down. They couldn't fly anymore. I do remember also in the south side of Italy trying to get the monastery mountain where they, the Germans used for an, an observation post and we were not supposed to bomb or shell the monastery until, until the when we went into uh, Angio, we were supposed to cut that off, but it didn't re really work. We couldn't advance more than about, what, five miles, 10 miles of the Angio beach, and uh, because they had us bogged down. And of course, sunny Italy is what the advertisement was always about when the tourist people we found out that sunny Italy was really a muddy Italy because of the rains. And we were also had to fight the mud. Rome was captured or liberated, let's say, because by that time, Italy became an ally. But when we went into Rome, nobody could have any real credit of being the first in Rome because they were coming in from the north, the south, and uh, I know when I went in, I was being shot at, sniper fire, you know, but uh, I was among the first in the, in Rome too, so, and uh, which was kind of eerie, you might say, being a big city, and then this fire firepower would come from somewhere. Good thing about Rome was I got a chance to see the Colosseum, all these historic places. Matter of fact, I even, at that time, Pope Pius XII was uh, the Pope at that time. And there was a real long line, I would say almost 500 yards of double line to so they could see the Pope hand, shake hands or kiss his ring, why not at that time? And not being Catholic, so it didn't bother me whether I stood in line or not. I just walked past them and went into the Vatican. But uh, 
I felt kind of honored because he saw me as I came up and we were, I would say maybe 15, 20 feet away from one another. And he gave me a salute and I saluted right back to him. And I got wounded driving a Jeep away out of a, uh, from the airplane. And the airplane dropped a bomb on me. And uh, of course it was a, a, what they call a personnel bomb, about a 50 pounder, otherwise I wouldn't be here. And uh, my friend that by, that was with me at the time, we both got wounded out of it. So and he, when he dropped his bomb, the Jeep rolled over it. The engine of the Jeep took most of it. And uh, the steering column was blown off. Big hole through the floorboard. I could see my leg drew up and I could see through my leg. And uh, then when I got the Jeep finally stopped, I rolled out of the Jeep because I couldn't, I couldn't climb out. I had to really literally fall out. And when I laid on the highway, I discovered I was wounded in both legs but I was all covered up with blood. I thought maybe my whole lower section was blown up. But uh, that's, well, I was a messenger that day. I was not a forward observer. As we as I laid on the, on the highway, I couldn't do anything, you might say. And uh, I called for my buddy and he crawled on his hands and on his hands and knees. Or matter of fact, on his belly, he was dragging himself up. He says, "I can't help you. I'm, I need help myself." I said, "Oh gosh, I guess this is the end then, because I could see, like I said, how I was wounded." And out out of the blue, a soldier come over the field, and he says, "I'll help you guys." And uh, how he helped was a jeep was coming up, loaded with his uh, ammunition, and uh, and he was wasn't going to stop. He was just going to go right through because all this was airplanes and everything going on, you know. And this GI stood in the middle of the burrow pit, and us on the jeep. He had to be run over if that Jeep wanted to go through. And, uh, and when, it, when the Jeep actually stopped right in front of him, he said, let's help these two guys. Well, there's three, three fellas in that Jeep. They jumped out, they grabbed me, threw me in the trailer and grabbed him, the other guy, and threw him on the hood and we were gone. And we drove maybe a mile or so to what they call the aid station. And then they dropped us off and then they went on. That was, that was really a, an interesting day at uh, February 2nd, <laughs> never forgot it. I was in Battle Creek, Michigan in the hospital. I was, uh, I was married April 14th and got my discharge May 1st. I was given what you call a, what is it, three week furlough before they gave me the, 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 the final papers. My wife was told by uh, service officers what to expect from me, you know, my, my I, but I wasn't aware of it. They, they, uh, I wasn't what they call combat fatigue, what we called it. Today they call it what, PSTP or something like that. And, uh, but uh, my wife was told to watch out for whatever it was. And I have to be remark, she was a remarkable lady because at times 
She was, uh, how would you say, very caring. I wasn't realized what she was doing, but I think I was. I come out of it better. Anyway, 65 years with her, so. Mr. Scheibner went on to become a line of type operator, setting type for the print industry. Today, he is retired and lives in Claremont. Mr. Scheibner is 91. To learn more about the World War II Veterans History Project, please visit our website at www.veteranshistoryproject.com. We look forward to seeing you again for more exciting stories from the greatest generation. Production support for the Veterans History Project is made possible by the Parity Financial Group, proudly saluting the extraordinary students who make up our future generation and the military veterans from the greatest generation.